Hello, it's Scott Manley here, coming to you in my dressing gown because I had to get up at 3 a.m. so I could watch the first launch of Boeing's CST-100 Starliner on its orbital flight test to the space station. Except that that's not what happened. So yes, this was going to be a test of a new rocket uh, and capsule configuration, the Atlas V N22, and a new capsule, the Boeing Starliner. Now, the rocket side of things, uh, the N22 means that it has no fairing and it has two solid rocket motors and two RL10 engines. For comparison, this is the Atlas V551. It means five meter fairing, five boosters down here and one RL10 engine inside the Centaur here. So Centaurs used to fly with two engines all the time and the more powerful Atlases meant that they could actually cut that back to one RL10 and save a whole bunch of money on that. So the two engine Centaur hasn't flown in a very long time. This was going to be a first test of that. The, uh, the Starliner being on top, that is a new aerodynamic configuration and they had to do some interesting stuff with an aero skirt to ensure that the shock waves didn't impact the Centaur uh, and over, you know, increase structural loading beyond requirement or beyond capabilities, etc. Anyway, that worked perfectly. The only thing I would say about the launch is that the coverage pretty much stopped as soon as the booster um, just separated. We had no more rocket cams after the first stage. The people on the ground got an amazing show because it launched just before sunrise, so it launched into the sun, it looked beautiful, there's some amazing photos coming out of that. The launch coverage on the internet was utterly terrible because we pretty much just watched a bunch of people watching screens and we couldn't even see the screens for in, for most of the time until it got to space. So one of the reasons why they're using the two engine Centaur is they need more thrust or they're supposed to have more thrust because they want to fly a lower trajectory than the Atlas V normally flies. Normally the Atlas V goes up pretty steeply and then turns over and takes a very long time to reach orbital speed. So it needs to take this high launch, angle, uh, launch apogee initially. With a crew on board, that's undesirable because if you have a failure, then you come straight back down a long way through the atmosphere and you go very, very fast. So by keeping it low, they, they would fly this lower trajectory. That would mean that if there was a failure at any point, they fall down, they don't have as far to fall, so they don't hit the atmosphere as hard and they don't get that same high G loading. Uh, and this had a lot of implications for the mission design, but uh, it also means that they put the spacecraft into a very, very low orbit initially. That when the Centaur burns out, they're in an orbit which will last maybe one orbit before they return to Earth. The reason being that if there were any failures on the spacecraft, with say the engines were out of commission or some other critical things, they would want the spacecraft to come back right away but, uh, and then of course, once it gets to that initial orbit, it's supposed to use the Starliner's engines, these little uh, OMAC onboard maneuvering thrusters to uh, insert itself into orbit. So just after separation, it's supposed to perform this maneuver to accelerate it into its target orbit and that does not happen. So what do they do? They send a signal to say, you really should be trying to get into orbit right now and it doesn't respond. They send it eventually again seven minutes later and then it does insert itself into the orbit, but by that point it has inserted itself into the wrong orbit and it has actually wasted a bunch of fuel messing around with its attitude control. And you can see this in the launch stream, the attitude's all over the place and it's burning its thrusters all the time. So what we've seen from the post-flight press conference is that there was something wrong with a mission clock which was triggering the automation system to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. The spacecraft attitude control was pointing in the wrong direction for a lot of it and it was being, it was very aggressively holding attitude, burning through a lot of fuel. So for some reason, some parts of the system were running on the wrong mission time and therefore doing the wrong thing. 
The reason why the signal never got through, the current theory is that they hit a gap in TDRS coverage. That's the tracking data and relay satellite system, right? That's what I was saying. Remember my video on how astronauts watch TV in space? Same thing. Well, it turns out that over the Middle East, over Indian Ocean, the coverage tends to be a little less good because uh, there's fewer satellites out that way. So with that, they sent a second signal and they ended up getting it into orbit. So as of right now, it does not have capability to get to the space station as planned. It's not gonna be able to dock. They are raising its orbit so that it will be in a 200 kilometer orbit or thereabouts, so that it will come down in two days on Sunday over White Sands Missile Range and land there safely. Because the big part of this mission that they want to demonstrate is that it can launch safely and that it can land safely. Because really that's what this is all about. Docking at the space station apparently isn't a requirement of the demo flights. And while both uh, Boeing and SpaceX wanted to include that, it's not apparently a requirement. So at this point, the press conference is obviously very much trying to put a, a happy face, this big smile on everything. It's like, oh, we're learning so much from this failure. Oh, they also said that if there were astronauts on board, they would have seen the problem and they would have fixed it and they would have just flown that spacecraft into space and docked at the space station. And that may well be, cru uh, be true. Certainly, I saw the attitude control and I was thinking, I could fly this better and I certainly am not qualified to do that. Um, but yeah, uh, they're also saying that they're not making a decision as to whether the next they'll require another uncrewed flight. And just the fact that they're saying that during a post-flight press conference makes me think they're gonna let Boeing fly crew on the next uh, flight, even if, they, um, even if they can't dock at the space station. So yeah, it looks like they're gonna spend two days in orbit. They're gonna test systems out. They're gonna perform you know, all the demonstrations they can. There is a possibility that they're considering to extend this to a longer flight and see if they can actually get near enough to the station that they can perform some sort of proximity operations or at least you know flying and testing out that their hardware can coordinate with the space station but they will not be docking because their uh, fuel reserves are too low and it's not like they burn much they only apparently burned like 25 percent of their fuel by the sound of things so I don't know what the, the mission rules are for this, but I expect that they are very strict and stringent because you've got a very expensive space station and a completely untested uh, rocket you know, space capsule up there. So yeah, as I said, uh, the Atlas V performed excellently. The spacecraft did not perform as expected. They also wanted to stress that if there were crew on board, they would not be at risk, even if they couldn't save the spacecraft and get it into the target orbit, they would still be able to return to Earth uh, safely and not get lost in space. Oh yeah, so one thing that came out from Jim Bridenstine was that he stated that the mission clock problem meant that the spacecraft had set dead zones that were much more stringent, much more precise than normal. Now a dead zone is where you've got a spacecraft that's trying to maintain attitude control and essentially, you know, if it goes a little off, it's supposed to fire its thrusters to come back. But if you increase the dead zone, you let it drift further before you let it drift back. And that means that the computer's working less, but more importantly, you're wasting less fuel. During burns, during maneuvers, attitude control is considered more important. It's a critical part of the mission. So the dead zones get shrunk down. And so it sounds like after it separated, it was in this high precision mode and it was very aggressively steering and burning through its fuel. That's how I interpret that. And again, it's one explanation for why it ended up where it did. So not a great day for Boeing Starliner. It didn't perform as expected. However, I'm gonna say good day for the Atlas V, which performed excellently in its new configuration, maintaining its perfect record. Uh, I'm gonna point out, by the way, that Boeing are not behind the Atlas V. Boeing were behind the Delta IV. The Delta IV was never really considered for the crew program because it's really expensive and because it sets itself on fire whenever it launches and that sort of tends to make a, you know, onlookers a little cagey about having astronauts in there. Uh, I expect that we will see the landing of Starliner on Sunday, so we'll look out for that. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.